This process has been described in detail by Stanford's own Professor Roughgarden in the Department of Biology. Thus, it should be relatively straightforward to figure out which was the case, especially given the constraint that the correct explanation for bipedality must also explain knuckle walking. There are many possible tests. One which I will present here is a rigorous cladistic analysis of CGH locomotor divergence. When we do this for the CGH clade, we are obviously interested in discerning a late Miocene adaptive radiation in African ape locomotion. There exist three possible trees. In each, it will be assumed that the LCA of chimps, gorillas, and humans, and orangs was a non-specialized palmigrade, meaning it walked on its palms, and that the fist walking is only present in the orang lineage. In the first, we see that the CGH LCA was a knuckle walker and that bipedality evolved only in the human lineage. In the second, we assume that the CGH LCA was a non-specialized palmigrade and that knuckle walking evolved in parallel in chimps and gorillas. In the third, we assume that the CGH LCA was a biped and that knuckle walking evolved as a reversal in chimps and gorillas. Here we see that assuming the CGH LCA was a biped is the least parsimonious because it causes two reversals. Assuming it was a knuckle walker is not necessarily the most parsimonious as it contains a very difficult change from a less specialized palmigrade to a very specialized knuckle walker and then to a very specialized biped. Assuming it was a non-specialized palmigrade causes a parallelism which, with two forms independently becoming knuckle walkers. Which of these last two is more parsimonious is a matter of debate, but in our opinion, going from a less specialized palmigrade to a very specialized knuckle walker to a very specialized biped is much less parsimonious than a locomotor parallelism in two closely related and recently divergent groups, especially during an adaptive radiation. There is accumulating evidence that knuckle walking did in fact evolve in parallel in, in chimps and gorillas such as differences in locomotor ontogeny and mechanics between gorillas and chimps, and differences in the incidence of traits strictly associated with knuckle walking, namely the orientation of the distal radius and the metacarpal dorsal ridges. These features have been driven to fixation in gorillas, but not in chimps, a fact that makes sense if knuckle walking arose slightly later in chimps after the GCH and the CH split. These features are completely absent from humans in all fossil bipeds. This should not be the case if, as cladogram 1 implies, human ancestors were knuckle walkers for millions of years. Cladogram 1 is consistent with a subsistence explanation for bipedality. In other words, that knuckle walking is an ancient trait preserved in gorillas and chimps, but modified in the human line due to a remarkable divergence in human subsistence. Cladogram 2 implies no correlation between the CGH locomotor radiation and dietary differences. If true, then gorillas and chimps evolved the same locomotor pattern in parallel, even as they were diverging in diet, with gorillas focusing on leaves. The lack of correlation is even more startling if the first bipeds were fruit eaters, a conclusion strongly supported by the fossil evidence of Australopithecine diets. If so, then chimps and human ancestors sharply diverged in locomotor pattern without a significant difference in diet. The lack of correlation between locomotor divergence and dietary divergence suggests that the former was driven by something other than subsistence pressure, namely predation pressure. More precisely, the differential impact of predation pressure in different environments. How would predation pressure have generated the divergence of a frugivorous, non-knuckle walking CH ancestor into a forced living frugivorous knuckle walker and a woodlands living frugivorous biped? In a more closed forest environment, we can hypothesize that relatively high selection would be placed on the ability to move quickly towards and climb trees to escape predators, along with the ability to ward off predators by appearing large and attacking with sticks or stones. In a more open environment, where trees are farther away, we can hypothesize relatively lower selection for moving quickly towards trees and even higher selection for detecting and warding off predators by appearing large and attacking with sticks or stones. Let's briefly turn now to the paleontological and paleoclimatological records of late Miocene Africa to see what that tells us about possible predation pressure on the CGH LCA. For most of Africa's history since the extinction of the dinosaurs, 
it has been a tropical island continent. And during this time period, Africa and Eurasia were teeming with ape species, as many as 100. This time also saw a relative lack of large-bodied carnivores in African dense forests, with most modern African carnivores not entering Africa until the end of the Miocene. It was only the intensification of Tibetan uplift, which blocks the westerly monsoons after about 7 million years ago, that really started drying out parts of northern Africa, which should be dense tropical forest today. Most, research, excuse me, most researchers have related this drying to hominin origins, but evoke subsistence or energetic theories. But an important part of this drying phenomenon was a faunal interchange, interchange with Eurasia about 7 million years ago, which brought in the adaptively radiating antelopes and their adaptively radiating predators, the leopard cats. Recent paleontological, molecular, and comparative analyses all support the notion that a leopard felid was present in the forest to woodland habitats of Africa by about six million years ago, right as or just before the hypothesized CHLCA divergence. In this situation, the opening of the Miocene tropical forests did not necessarily bring subsistence pressure, but rather predation pressure. Now, what can the anti-predation behaviors of modern chimps tell us about the likely anti-predation behaviors of the CHLCA? Christoph Bosch reports predation by leopards is the leading cause of were The chimpanzees were seen to stand erect, charge bipedally, and grab sticks or stones to use as weapons. In one instance, a group of over seven chimps chased a leopard into a burrow under a tree and for over an hour used branches as clubs to try to hit or stab the leopard. These observations conform with other descriptions of leopard chimp encounters by other researchers. Note that even though Thai chimps can avoid leopard predation two thirds of the time, it is still their highest cause of mortality. This hypothesis that a predator prey arms race between leopards and the CHLCA in early Pliocene woodland habitats drove the transition to bifidality can also explain much about Australopithecines that is otherwise difficult to explain. Descriptions of the morphology of Artipithecus ramidus suggest that the only skeletal differences between it and a more generalized quadrupedal Miocene ape ancestor is that the pelvis has been modified to enhance upright posture. Its limbs were not modified to enhance bipedal walking. It still had very long arms, short legs, and a divergent big toe. Its teeth lacked adaptation to heavy chewing, which is related to open environments. This conforms with what would be expected if bipedality was a response to predation pressure in a wooded environment with selection for the ability to stand and fight, and the opposite of what would be expected in response to subsistence pressure in an open environment. Ardipithecus's likely descendant, Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy species, lacked many of the specializations for efficient bipedality present in humans and retained many arboreal traits seen in chimps, but no longer in us. This seemingly strange mix of obligate terrestrial bipedality with other primitive features indicative of high levels of arboreality and frugivorous diet has been the subject of much debate over the last 40 years. But the predation hypothesis would predict that uh, the afarensis functional anatomy is the product of balancing selection for climbing trees and eating fruit and the ability to move bipedality, excuse me, bipedally in the, and in groups on the ground in order to minimize predation pressure while traveling between trees. I also describe in these slides here that a, a probable descendant of Afarensis, Australopithecus garhi, developed longer legs, stone tool making, and a large brain at about 2.5 million years ago, and how this is probably related to subsistence pressure because at the same time, we see the evolution of the robust Australopithecines who are adapted to eating hard, uh, rough food items. So here we see adaption for, to subsistence pressure, but two and a half million years after the origins of bipedality. Garhi later develops into Homo. So the above are just the broad strokes of how a Darwinian approach to the origins of human bipedality should be conceived and pursued. Future research should focus on specifically analyzing the totality of ecological, comparative morphological, and fossil data to test the predation hypothesis of human origins, and at last close the final chapter in Darwin's legacy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.